I hope you can hear me and that the mic is, is functioning properly. Well, ladies and gentlemen and friends, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Museum of Modern Art and to this lecture by Professor Chomsky, um, which is being held in conjunction with a major exhibition on East Timor, which is, uh, can be seen in the um, downstairs in the restaurant. And I hope that you will be able to see it uh, after this, this meeting. It will be open for half an hour afterwards. The format of tonight will be that I will make a very short opening address. I will then turn to Jean Boavida, who is an East Timorese, who is now studying at Campion Hall, to give something of an impression of what it has been like to actually live through the years of the Indonesian military occupation, and to particularly dwell on the developments which have happened within the East Timorese church, the Catholic Church of East Timor, and the way in which that has focused in and helped to sustain um, the growing nationalist resistance in East Timor. Arnold Cohen will then follow. Arnold has been almost single-handed the architect of keeping East Timor in front of the public eye in the United States during 16 years when it was extremely difficult for, mu for much of that time to really be able to hold it as an issue of major public concern because of the way in which the press and those who could report what had been going on in East Timor were excluded and were banned from visiting the territory and also from what Professor Chomsky will be talking about in the fourth uh, presentation, the international matrix which has kept East Timor um, in the position it has been in during the past 16 to 17 years. I'm a specialist on Indonesian history and to my shame it took me nearly 10 years to actually realize what was happening in East Timor. I remember the first indication that something was pretty seriously wrong was when I was sitting in a restaurant in Leiden and read that five Western journalists, two Britons, Australians and New Zealander, had been shot and killed while covering the war at Balibo in October of 75. And I thought, well, it's a bit odd for five journalists and cameramen just to be wiped off the face of the earth just like that, just fulfilling their duties. And it was not until 1983 when I was asked to review the book written by James Dunn, an excellent book on East Timor called Timor, A People Betrayed, that I realized what had happened to them, that they'd been shot in cold blood by the Indonesian army, and that not only they had died, but somewhere around 100,000 Timorese out of a population of 688,000 had died in the first three and a half years of the Indonesian occupation alone, per capita and in terms of the suffering per square inch in East Timor, certainly perhaps greater than that even of Pol Pot's Cambodia. In the following year, after 83, we tried to hold a meeting to coincide with a visit to Oxford by Jose Ramos Horta, who later came as a visiting fellow to St. Anthony's, and like Arnold, has been very much instrumental in terms of holding the, the cause of East Timor aloft in the UN and in major international circles, in the circles of diplomacy and international relations. For a very long period of time, he has been a principal advocate of East Timor's right of self-determination and the right for a future which the people of East Timor can decide for themselves. And when we organized a meeting in New College, um, barely 20 people turned up. It was a beautiful hall, as large as this, but 20 people were there. And I think it's a measure of the change which has been wrought during the past year, a change which occurred because of the massacre, the Santa Cruz massacre, and the way in which that massacre was reported in the West. Two of the journalists and photographers who were there at the time, Steve Cox, who took the photographs, some of which you can see downstairs in the exhibition, Peter Gordon, who headed the Yorkshire television team, which made the very moving 
documentary on East Timor, which was shown in January last year, both are here tonight. And it's due to the courage of Peter and Steve, Chris Wenner, who actually took the footage, the video footage, in the cemetery itself, and many others who supported that work that the world knew about what had been going on, something of what had been going on in East Timor. It was certainly not the first massacre. Aria Branca, La Cluta, Kraras, there had been many massacres which had punctuated the bloody rule and occupation of the Indonesians since 1975, but this was the first time that it was actually shown across the world. Australian customs officials and authorities tried to, in fact, confiscate the tape, so sensitive was Australia to the ramifications of showing that film. And it's to their credit and to their enormous courage that we know today what we do know about East Timor, and a room like this can be filled almost to capacity in order to hear a talk on East Timor. No doubt the character of the main speaker tonight, Professor Chomsky, has been a major draw. We've hijacked him from the philosophers for one night, and we're very pleased to have been able to do so. But it's also, I think, very much due to the publicity and to the awareness, the growing awareness, which has enabled such a gathering to come into being. We'd like to send a message tonight to the people of East Timor that they have not been forgotten, that they have a hope for a better world, and that Oxford, which has a link now with the presidency in the United States, can have an influence on events, um, perhaps larger than one might think. There will be a student um, club and student society association which will be founded called the Friends of East Timor, which will be founded at St. Anne's, and the founders are here tonight, and if you'd like to to know more about it, you can get in touch with me or, or others who are involved with work on East Timor. So without further ado, I, I will turn to Joao Boavida, who is a uh, graduate student at Campion Hall, working on a thesis to do with nationalism and religion in East Timor. And most of all, he has been a personal witness to the events which we will be talking of tonight. Thank you. When I first went to Australia in 1987, I was invited to give a talk at one of the universities in Melbourne. Um, I was quite nervous at the time because my English wasn't very good. And before the talk, there was a student who came to me and asked me whether I was the speaker. And I said yes. She then went on saying that she knew quite well about the plight of the Timorese people and that she was very upset about her government's policy on East Timor. And then she asked me where exactly East Timor was. And she wondered whether it was somewhere in the northern suburb of Victoria. And of course, I said yes. <laughs> but a bit further north. <laughs> so we literally went through all the suburbs around Victoria. And we ended up at the top end of Australia, which is Darwin. By then, she realized the mistake she had made that she simply had mistaken East Timor with one of the Aboriginal tribes in Australia. Well, what exactly I want to say tonight, it's nothing complex. The simple fact that the Timorese struggle still survives today, it is mainly due to the Catholic Church and its priests in East Timor. <laughs> 
And by this, I don't mean to undervalue and to undervalue the spirit of nationalism of the Timorese people themselves. And nor do I overlook the efforts of individuals and group solidarities around the world. But there is certainly an explosive phenomenon which has taken place in East Timor over the last 17 years. And this phenomenon is the real religious element which I'm going to describe it briefly in the following terms. First and foremost, since the Indonesian invasion of East Timor in 1975, the Timorese Church has adopted an attitude of mutual accommodation with the Timorese people. Throughout the 17 years of occupation, the Catholic Church in East Timor has given all sorts of supports and in several ways to the suffering East Timorese people. In other words, the Timorese Catholic Church has been the only and real haven in East Timor under those 17 years and continues to be. And secondly, as the Timorese Church begins or began to look at the Bible from the underside, that is, from the perspective of the suffering Timorese people, many East Timorese came in mass in big numbers and converted to Catholicism. From 30% of Catholics in 1975, when the Indonesians, or when the Portuguese government left East Timor, the number went up 60%, and now the total number of converted, of those converted to Catholicism is something around 95%. If the figure means anything at all, it must mean that this is a potentially important unifying factor for the Timorese people in the face of this real threat inflicted upon the Timorese people on the part of the Indonesian government. And thirdly, if the struggle of East Timor still survives, this is mainly because the Timorese Church has restrained himself, itself from becoming part of the Indonesian bishops' conference. And this simply means that while the socio-political structures in East Timor have been suppressed to a certain degree, the Catholic Church itself, with 90% of the population, are still directly answerable to the Vatican. And this is in some ways seen in a very political and diplomatic terms in that we, the Timorese people, in fact, we are still independent from the Indonesians. And the Indonesian government is entirely aware, like the Timorese people themselves, that this has been the only main stumbling block on its way to fully integrate East Timor into the Republic of Indonesia. Well, I am bringing up my talk in this
formula because I wasn't worried that I was going to give this talk tonight. So um, I should conclude my views in that I will not be surprised if sooner or later the Timorese and Indonesian confrontation will take a different level of conflict that is the religious one because we have to bear in mind that although the Indonesian state is not Islamic state it is nevertheless the largest Muslim country in the world in terms of population. And to come to the Istimo itself, we are looking at something like 600,000 people. And given that 95% of the Timorese people are now Catholics, we could soon face a very different struggle a very different fight or confrontation or conflict that is the religious one between the East Timorese and the Indonesians. Well, as the Timorese, all I want to say or perhaps to appeal to you, first of all, I should thank you for coming. And I'm sure what Professor Chomsky is going to to tell us will be most interesting. But my only appeal is that last year, the British aid to the Indonesian government amounted to some 15, one five, 15 million pounds. Well, this might be insignificant, but it all together makes up some two, over two billion dollars that the Indonesian government has been receiving from the international community. All I want you to do is to write to your MPs not to stop the aid to the Indonesian government because after all, the Indonesian government is very much an aid dependent. But all I want you to do is to ask UMP and to ask the British government that any forthcoming aid to the Indonesian government will have to be connected to the human rights situation, not only in East Timor, but also in Indonesia. Thanks. Thanks. First of all, I'd like to thank John Leslie for his work over the past year and a half on this exhibition, without which it would be impossible. Uh, the quality of this is largely due to him and to the courage of the photographers. Uh, one thing that I'd like to say regarding the level of awareness of East Timor over the years, I'm reminded of an incident in early 1979 when a Somalia-like situation was brewing in East Timor, largely owing to Indonesian military operations. I was sitting in a coffee shop in New York with Jose Ramos Horta, who was then the representative of East Timor's independence movement at the United Nations. And the waiter in the coffee shop asked Jose, where are you from? And Jose said, Brazil. And I said, Jose, why did you do that? And he said, I'm just tired of explaining to people. You know, I just really... <laughs> I really want to you know, take some time off and, and not be bothered, and it's just too long and too complicated. Well, later that year, some awareness started to break through in the American press, uh, and Noam Chomsky was responsible, uh, along with people from the Timorese Catholic Church and other people with connections to that church. Uh, Noam Chomsky was giving some talks at various places 
where there were uh, editorial writers for large American newspapers. And Noam was pointing out what was going on in East Timor, and the editorial writers and other people were quite chagrined that they couldn't really point to much of anything that they had said or done. And uh, then when refugees and other people showed up with evidence, we were able to get in and see them quite quickly, and they were rather, the major newspapers were rather anxious to do something, at least for a time. Of course, they would never admit that it was because Noam Chomsky had raised questions about their uh, professional performance. But in any case, it all fits together because if one skips ahead to the period uh, surrounding the Gulf War, uh, Professor Chomsky coincidentally was coming to Britain to speak at a conference uh, put on by the Catholic Institute for International Relations in London. And he pointed out quite properly that uh, Britain and the United States were going after Saddam Hussein, yet nobody had thought of bombing Jakarta in response to what the Indonesians had been doing for all those many years in East Timor. Uh, as a result of this, some journalists uh, in the British press uh, became interested in going to Timor and investigating the situation, notably U. O'Shaughnessy for, for the Observer, but not only him, uh, there were other people, in addition to Yorkshire Television, who, were, to their credit, were already interested and were already investigating the situation. But all of these uh, various trails led to the 12th of November last year, because were it not for uh, efforts on, on the part of, of, of people like Noam Chomsky, the church people from East Timor, uh, it would have been impossible to spread the kind of background awareness that, that enabled uh, the journalists uh, who were there at the time to, to have a receptive audience on the outside. Uh, and, you know, were it not for the efforts of, of these, these people, uh, the American Congress would not have become involved to the extent that there was, there was a basis of concern when the massacre took place last year. And within recent weeks, U.S. military training to Indonesia was cut off. It was the first sanction of any kind that the United States has carried out against Indonesia in, in the 17 years since the invasion of East Timor. Um, we're in a situation now where uh, the, the president-elect of the United States, Bill Clinton, has uh, made a statement, made a statement some months ago during the New York primary saying that American policy on East Timor had been unconscionable and he would do much more. Uh, the real issue, of course, is, is how much will the, the well-entrenched interests, business interests and, and other kinds of international financial interests that, that have uh, prevented action, uh, directly or indirectly, on the Timor question these, these 17 years, how well they will succeed in, in getting to Clinton and stopping any action before it begins. But uh, one thing is for sure, that uh, the, the, um, the work of the uh, Timorese independence movement in staying alive all these years against tremendous odds. I mean, if one looks at the photographs downstairs from people in 1975, I mean, most of these people who were known then are either dead or in prison or house servants for the Indonesian military. And yet, uh, a new generation has sprung up that refuses to be intimidated. And so, uh, all of these factors combine with the absolutely key role of Yorkshire Television in, in getting uh, filmed evidence, first, of, of the long-term pattern of Indonesia atrocities, and second, and most importantly, of the massacre that took place last November, assures that we're not going to return to a, the kind of silence that existed many years before. And I think that you know this Oxford-educated American president may have a little more than he's uh, bargained for in Congress and from the international media. And so I think Noam, on that note, Noam Chomsky can tell you a little bit about the context that brought us to where we are today. Thanks.
The, uh, let me begin with the uh, uh, title of the exhibit, 1974-92, uh, Years of Silence, Images of Resistance. Uh, the title is appropriate. I'll add a slight quibble in a moment. Uh, but uh, it does omit a lot, of course, and I'd like to concentrate actually on what it omits, namely the years of silence prior to 1974, uh, which in my opinion are critical for understanding uh, what has been uh, happening uh, in uh, 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 relation to East Timor since, since that time, and also provide an extremely illuminating insight uh, into the nature of Western civilization, I think, if we're willing to take a close look at it. Uh, the years of silence with regard to Indonesia, uh, in the, uh, they go back actually almost 500 years, that's the first European settled colony, but let's start with the end of the Second World War. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, there was a new world order, as it was in fact called, uh, which was uh, unusually well and carefully designed. Uh, the reason that that was possible was because there was one global power that uh, had a historically unprecedented degree of, uh, of wealth and uh, military force at its command and uh, intended to organize the world uh, in the interests of uh, uh, domestic power centers and did so in a sophisticated and uh, careful way. It happens to be a very free society, uh, maybe the most free in the world, uh, and there's an enormous amount of information about what was done, so the contours and character and details of the planning are quite well understood. Uh, and they're not, uh, uh, I won't run through the whole story, but the basic outlines are pretty clear. Uh, actually, the basic outlines were perhaps put most lucidly by Winston Churchill uh, in 1945 when he was talking about how the world should be organized. Uh, and he said that the uh, government of the world should be in, ha in the hands of the rich nations, uh, the uh, rich countries, the rich men who are uh, living at peace in their habitations, rather ample habitations, uh, the satisfied nations uh, who already have what they need, uh, and they should run the world. Uh, he said, our power uh, has placed us above the rest. Uh, the rest should stay in the servants' quarters uh, uh, if they start to try to have some influence or control, they'll just cause problems. Uh, but we're already satisfied. We already own everything. Uh, so as long as we run the world, everything will be fine. The rich men living, dwelling at peace within their habitations. The people in the servants' quarters repeatedly are not all that happy about it. Uh, there's an expression of that in this morning's Guardian. The chairman of the South Commission, Julius Nyerere, has uh, another plea which will not be listened to for a different form of world order, uh, but they keep making these unseemly noises and doing unpleasant things, uh, and they have to be controlled, often stamped in the face, uh, to show where they belong. That's basically the history of the world. And there's a domestic analog as well. Uh, now, the actual architects of policy uh, put, uh, they describe the matter less lyrically than Churchill, uh, and somewhat more explicitly, and they also didn't exactly share his conception of where uh, Britain was going to fit into this system, much to his dismay. Out of politeness, I'll leave out what they said about it privately. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, the general idea was the same, just a different, different choices as to who was going to run the show. Uh, and the general idea w was to be that the uh, uh, mansions of the rich had to be reconstructed. Uh, primarily what were called the great workshops, uh, Germany and Japan, uh, German-based Europe and Japan and its periphery, they were going to be the centers of the industrial world, subordinated to the United States, of course. Germany and Japan had just demonstrated their prowess in the preceding years, and they, in fact, had only made one mistake. They didn't do it uh, subordinated to the United States. 
Uh, they did it on their own, and that doesn't work, as Saddam Hussein learned in 1990. Uh, as long as you carry out your atrocities under orders or uh, subordinated to the master, it's just fine. Uh, you can read that every morning in the British press these days. Uh, but if you do it uh, in defiance of the master, uh, that won't work. Uh, but in 1945, they had learned their lesson, and now they had to be reconstituted, uh, but under the uh, under U.S. domination. Uh, the uh, uh, other, as Kissinger put the point some years later, uh, other powers have uh, regional responsibilities, which they are to carry out within the overall framework of order managed in Washington. That's the way the world was supposed to be. By the time Kissinger said it, it was getting hard to uh, impose those rules. But in 1945, it wasn't very difficult. Uh, so Japan had to be uh, offered uh, what George Kennan, one of the leading architects of policy, head of the State Department planning staff, policy planning staff, uh, Japan had to be given what Kennan called its empire toward the south. Uh, uh, Western Europe had to be granted the opportunity to exploit Africa, as Cannon put it, for its reconstruction. Uh, Britain would share with the United States in running the energy reserves of the Middle East, but with the United States on top. Uh, and the uh, Western Hemisphere would be completely in the hands of the United States, and everyone would be kicked out, including Britain and France. Uh, and uh, that's roughly the story. Uh, Southeast Asia had a role in this. Southeast Asia, as the policy planning staff of the State Department put it, was to fulfill its main function uh, as a source of raw materials and markets for the reconstruction of uh, Europe and Japan, and of course to uh, uh, extend and strengthen overall US power as well. Now, within Southeast Asia, Indonesia had the key role simply because of its wealth. Uh, Indonesia, uh, uh, as Kennan, going back to Kennan again, who was leading, a leading uh, figure in designing the post-war world, uh, Kennan described, in 1948, described the problems of Indonesia. I'm quoting, the problems of Indonesia are the most crucial issue of the moment in our struggle with the Kremlin. 1948, so not a small role. The phrase struggle with the Kremlin is a code word for conflict with independent nationalist forces and tendencies uh, that interfere with the service role of the South. They may have a connection with the Kremlin or they may not. Uh, that's more or less incidental. Uh, it's, the, it's their independence that's intolerable. Uh, they are hungry nations interfering with the rich men who are supposed to rule the world, and that's not their role. Their role is to be servants. Uh, the, uh, uh, if you read through the American planning record, these dangerous elements are described regularly as ultra-nationalists or radical nationalists or sometimes communists. Uh, the Kremlin itself was an enemy largely for the same reason. It had pulled out of the third world in 1917. Uh, and as one high-level planning uh, study put it, uh, the problem that the communists posed was that their unwillingness or inability to complement the industrial societies of the West. They were radical nationalists, uh, big powerful ones in that case, but little ones are also uh, unacceptable. Uh, uh, the, uh, there's a more general problem uh, or sort of an, another aspect to this problem of uh, radical nationalists who interfere with the proper rule of the world by the rich men. Uh, that's a problem which became quite serious in Indonesia. Uh, it was described by President Eisenhower uh, in uh, the mid-50s. Uh, he said the, he was complaining about what he called the ability of the communists to appeal to uh, the masses. Uh, something which we have no capacity to duplicate, he said. Somehow what we're trying to offer the masses doesn't get much enthusiasm among them. And his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, added that uh, the, the communists appeal to the poor uh, who are always trying to plunder the rich. That's the big problem of world history. 
Uh, and and uh, somehow, since when we call upon the rich to plunder the poor, it's hard to duplicate this appeal to the masses. Nobody ever figured out exactly why some failure of public relations involved. Uh, well, when you can't suppress, you know, if you can't deal with these criminals who are trying to plunder the rich, uh, or the other criminals who are appealing to them, uh, if you can't suppress them in one or another way, you may have to turn to the ultimate uh, weapon, namely extermination. Uh, and in fact, that brings us to Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia was supposed to be, in this new world order, granted a kind of nominal independence, uh, but under Dutch tutelage, the general idea was, as an early CIA memorandum put it, that we're in favor of recognizing the, nationalist, the national aspirations of the former colonial powers, but that has to be balanced against the, need, the needs of the former colonial powers themselves. And uh, when that balance raised the problem, there was never any question about which, uh, which interest was going to win out. Uh, uh, in Indonesia, there were essentially three forces. Uh, there was President Sukarno, the leader of the nationalist movement, who was an independent nationalist uh, and therefore already unacceptable. Uh, then there was a mass-based popular party, the Indonesian Communist Party, which was, needless to say, totally unacceptable. Uh, and thirdly, there was the army, uh, which more or less shared U.S. aims and was therefore always referred to as the moderates or the pragmatists. Uh, pra these are technical terms that you have to understand. Uh, a pragmatist is somebody who does what uh, we want. Uh, we're pragmatic by definition because we always do what we want. Uh, and others are pragmatic if they go along with it. Uh, and, and moderates are those who you know, are pragmatic. So these are some of the terminology of uh, political discourse you have to master if you want to become a professor somewhere. Uh, the, uh, so the army were moderates, and the uh, Communist Party was just more of these guys trying to plunder the rich. Uh, they were engaged in what was called in those days concealed aggression or internal aggression. That's a term that refers to political victories by the wrong people. Uh, that was a problem all over the world and always has been. Uh, the uh, Indonesian, uh, I, I should say that uh, it, it, uh, there, there was a lot of concern that there would be an internal uh, victory by concealed aggression, that is by political means, since that was the only mass-based party and that obviously had to be stopped. Uh, Kennan, again in 1948, uh, said that if there was, if the Communist Party did manage to take power internally, uh, that would be an infection, he said, that would spread over all South Asia and cause enormous uh, problems and, of course, was unacceptable. And recall that Indonesia was regarded as the major issue in our struggle with you know, third world nationalism at the time, struggle with the Kremlin and code words. Uh, Timor actually was mentioned in this internal planning. I can only find one reference to it uh, by uh, leading State Department Roosevelt advisor Sumner Wells, who mentioned back in the early 40s that he thought when they're talking about the future of various parts of the world that Timor ought to, has a right to uh, independence, uh, but he said uh, it would certainly take a thousand years. So we don't have to worry about that. Uh, the, uh, 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 th there was an army massacre and repression, the moderates did their job in 1948. Uh, still, Sukarno remained in power. The United States was never very happy with that. The CIA began to support right-wing parties. That didn't work. Uh, they supported a, uh, uh, an insurrection uh, in 1957 and 58 that was put down. Uh, the U.S. then turned to a classic technique for overthrowing civilian government, one that's used over and over again, uh, namely cut off any aid or assistance or support to the government, but maintain, in fact, even increase uh, military aid. Uh, that's a natural way to overthrow a civilian government. After all, who's going to overthrow it? Uh, that's actually, as far as I can see, what was going, what lies behind the Iran-Contra the Iran 
story of the 1980s, from the early 1980s, the United States was trying to overthrow the government of Iran in a classic fashion, uh, supporting the military, uh, cutting relations with civilians, as one of the uh, leading uh, Israeli figures, uh, Uri Hebrani, who was later identified as being involved in this, as he said, in fact, over BBC, and uh, who had a very good program on this in 1982, uh, he said, if we can find an Iranian general who can shoot down a thousand people in the streets, uh, we can restore the situation that uh, existed under the Shah. Uh, and that was done in Chile. It was, uh, it was also done in Indonesia. So that's the policy that began uh, in the, after the failure of the 57, 58, uh, uh, 58 uh, rebellion. Now, there was, well, there was a lot of concern about the prospects and if it was going to work. Uh, one of the leading U.S. specialists on Indonesia, Guy Pawker, worked with the Rand Corporation and uh, the Millet Pentagon. Uh, he, uh, in 1962, he urged his contacts in the Indonesian military to, in his words, uh, st to strike and to sweep their house clean. Uh, a year later, William Kintner, another professor teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, worried, expressed his concern over, uh, again, this concealed aggression, the danger that there might be just a political takeover from inside by the only mass-based political party, which would be a total disaster. And he therefore said that with Western help, free Asian political leaders, together with the military, must liquidate the enemy's political and guerrilla armies. Uh, now, the prospects of liquidating the enemy's political armies were uncertain. Uh, Parker, again, in 1964, uh, wrote that he was concerned because the Indonesian military, he said, probably lacked the ruthlessness and discipline that made it possible for the Nazis to suppress the communists in Germany. Uh, however, it turned out that his pessimism was, I, I should say incidentally that this was the same concern that the Kennedy administration felt about the Vietnamese generals uh, in, in recently released documents. Kennedy's ambassador to uh, South Vietnam, Henry Cabot Lodge in 1963, complained about the same thing. He said uh, the South Vietnamese just lacked the discipline and violence and savagery of the Nazis, and they can't do what we want them to do. We don't know how, they're supposed to have reserves of violence, but we can't seem to get that organized. Uh, well, in the case of uh, Indonesia, uh, it turned out that the pessimism was unfounded. Uh, uh, when uh, uh, six in, uh, Parker, in fact, pointed this out a couple of years later, uh, there were six Indonesian generals assassinated on October 30th, and 1965, and then this, Suharto uh, uh, took over and then came this huge bloodbath. And a couple of years later, Parker said that the assassination of the generals elicited the ruthlessness that I had not anticipated uh, and led to the death of a large number of communist cadres. They did act like Nazis, thankfully, uh, and uh, somewhere around uh, half a million, or nobody really knows, half a million to a million, some number of people were slaughtered in uh, the hugest uh, uh, bloodbath since the Holocaust, uh, mostly landless peasants, uh, and the Communist Party was wiped out, no more fear of any popular political organization, and the generals were firmly in power, and uh, Sukarno soon disappeared. Uh, the, we don't know a lot about the U.S. involvement in this. The, documentary record still has not been declassified, but there's enough to know that the U.S. supported the coup openly, gave aid. Uh, the only uh, re the government that is reacted with enthusiasm to the massacre, uh, its only hesitation, which is repeated in internal documents, is the fear that if, the, if U.S. support for the massacre was too overt, it might play into the hands of Sukarno and undercut the good work that the uh, army was doing. Uh, in the, uh, the public domain, we, of course, have a complete record, and that's extremely illuminating. There was total euphoria all over the West as the corpses, the piles of corpses mounted. It's hard to find an exception to this. Uh, Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense, uh, testified before Congress shortly after uh, all the basic facts were known about the slaughter. Uh, he was asked about the U.S. policy of aiding 
the Indonesian military in the early 60s at a time when we were extremely hostile to Indonesia and he was asked whether this paid dividends and he said yes in retrospect it had paid dividends uh, referring proudly to the uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of slaughtered people. Uh, the blood was still flowing at that time. Uh, later he wrote uh, privately to President Johnson uh, that uh, U.S. that what was particularly helpful, he said, was bringing Indonesian military officers to the United States, to places like Harvard, uh, where they got what he called the right orientation and learned the skills that they were able to uh, uh, employ with such efficiency uh, uh, in uh, Indonesia. Uh, Freedom House uh, published an advertisement by a group of uh, 114 people who described themselves as the moderate segment of the intellectual community in which they lauded uh, the U.S. Uh, war in Vietnam because it had provided a shield for what they referred to as the dramatic changes that had taken place in Indonesia, the most dramatic being uh, the, this huge uh, bloodbath. Uh, in fact, that was the logic of the Vietnam War from the beginning was to ensure that uh, there would be no infection spreading from Vietnam. And the idea was that the resolve that was shown by the United States in attacking South Vietnam, what's called in doctrinally correct terminology, defending South Vietnam from its own people, uh, another case of internal aggression, as it was called, the resolve that the US showed in uh, attacking South Vietnam and then the rest of Indochina uh, encouraged the uh, Indonesian generals and others in the neighborhood, like in Thailand and the Philippines and so on, to take things into their own hand, to strike and sweep their house clean, as Kintner put it, uh, and to end any threat of other infections that might spread. Uh, McGeorge Bundy, years later, he was National Security Advisor, uh, thinking back over this period, uh, said that in retrospect, he thinks that after the Indonesian coup in 1965, it was probably unnecessary for the United States to continue the war in Vietnam. Thinking it over, he says, we basically got what we wanted at that time. Uh, by end of 1965, Vietnam was pretty well destroyed anyway, and uh, Indonesia was back under control, uh, and other places, the, the infections weren't spreading, so we probably made a tactical error by going on and costing ourselves uh, too much pain and dollars. Uh, the, uh, uh, Time magazine, in one of the typical responses, had a, an, a cover story uh, on what they called the West's best news uh, in, uh, for years. Uh, the title of the story was Vengeance with a Smile. It was 11 pages uh, about what they described as the boiling bloodbath that took 400,000 lives, uh, about which they were just euphoric and enthusiastic. The uh, leading political commentator, the political comment uh, columnist of the New York Times, James Reston, actually that phrase, leading political commentator, is another euphemism. It means the State Department spokesman in the New York Times. His job is to publish leaks that he got from some State Department official the day before and look like a big thinker because of this and so on. Uh, the, he published an article called, uh, this is well into 1966 when everything was known, it was called Gleam of Light in Asia. Uh, and he said, we shouldn't be so downbeat about the bad news from Vietnam. There's also good news in Asia. There's a gleam of light, namely Indonesia. And he said the United States is being kind of reticent about its role in all of this, but in fact, uh, they're just kind of, you know, they don't want to show off. I said the U.S. role was really much more significant than Washington is letting on. Uh, without direct U.S. aid and involvement and encouragement, the Indonesian generals would never have been able to carry this off. Uh, the, I, just out of some form of masochism, about a year ago, I went through the whole record of New York Times editorials on the, uh, on the topic in those years, and they're pretty remarkable. They're uniform, full of euphoric, completely, uh, full of praise for what they called the Indonesian moderates, uh, though they recognized that the moderates had carried out what they called a staggering mass slaughter, uh, but that didn't change the fact that they were moderates, and that's right, remember, because they were pragmatists working for us. Uh, the, uh, 
Uh, they said that the staggering mass slaughter carried out by the moderates does raise a critical question for Washington. But they were happy to see that the question had been answered correctly. Uh, the critical question was whether Washington should openly embrace and support the moderates or whether it should do it more quietly. And uh, Washington had uh, chosen the right path. It had, Washington didn't embrace the new leaders too effusively, uh, they said, and because that would have hurt them and that was very wise. That's the only uh, critical. They, meanwhile, Washington, they said, was giving them generous aid, uh, which is the right thing, of course, uh, but it was very nicely handled. There are other possible questions that might come to mind. They weren't raised, and in fact, I can't find them raised anywhere in Western commentary. Uh, you might, uh, if you're equally masochistic, look back at the British press in those days and see what was said. As far as I can tell, I've only sampled outside the United States. It was pretty much the same. Euphoria over the gleam of light in Asia uh, with this extraordinary massacre. Uh, the, uh, and and uh, by, by 1977, uh, th there had been a complete role reversal. One of the leading Asia hands, uh, George MacArthur, uh, wrote that the, the, the Indonesian Communist Party had, as he put it, subjected the country to a bloodbath. In other words, they had put their necks under the knife in a, another communist atrocity. Uh, and so it goes to the present. Uh, just recently, the Christian Science Monitor had a review article on Indonesia in which it said that after his 1965 achievements, referring to Suharto, many in the West were keen to cultivate Jakarta's new moderate leader, Suharto, after he had done his job properly. Here in England, the economist uh, shortly after described Suharto as a person who is at heart benign perhaps thinking of his attitude towards transnational corporations. Uh, though the economists recognize that there are what they call propagandists for the guerrillas uh, who talk about, uh, who, uh, talk about the, the army's savagery and torture and other fabrications of that sort, uh, the, these people are propagandists for the guerrillas rather than, say, distinguished human rights activists because they have completely the wrong story to tell. And so it continues. Uh, the Indonesian generals fortunately acted like the Nazis, uh, carried out a staggering mass slaughter, uh, destroyed the danger of the concealed aggression by a political party that might have tried to plunder the rich or interfered with the rich men who rule the world. So naturally, everyone is euphoric. Uh, their only concern is that uh, maybe we'll, it'll look, we'll look bad if we're too openly euphoric, so you've got to do it quietly the way Washington did. Uh, well, as I say, this casts a, quite an interesting light on Western civilization. Uh, one really has to read the originals in order to appreciate it. These are just samples, and they're quite astonishing. That's the context for the East Timor invasion. Uh, the, uh, and now just a minor quibble about the title. Uh, the silence, I'll speak most of the, about the United States here, which is where I've looked at it closely, in fact, comprehensively. Uh, the silence didn't begin in 1974, it began in 1975. In 1974 and 75, there was considerable coverage of East Timor, surprisingly. Uh, the coverage was in the context of the uh, collapse of the Portuguese empire which caused much concern at the time because there was fear that that might stir up uh, radical nationalist uh, currents around the world interfering with the service function. That was taken very seriously and in that context uh, there, was, uh, uh, there was a surprising amount of coverage of uh, East Timor. Uh, the silence began uh, really on December 19th, not, not that there was truth, but there was coverage. The silence began in, 19, in December 1975 with the Indonesian invasion. From then on, there's a sharp decline in coverage. It reaches zero, in the, zero literally, in the United States and Canada, only two countries I looked at. It reaches zero in 1978, which is the year in which the atrocities peaked and in which, in fact, uh, Jimmy Carter uh, 
took some time off from his sermons about human rights uh, to uh, increase U.S. aid to Indonesia because they were actually running out of arms in the uh, war against this tiny country. Uh, at that, as the massacres increased, the coverage declined, hitting zero as they peaked in 1978. It's what led to that Somalia-like situation that Arnold was describing. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, U.S. was providing crucial military and diplomatic support to the invasion. That's not at issue. The U.S. was providing 90% of the arms when the arms supply began to dwindle, increased the flow of arms. Uh, at the United Nations, uh, Ambassador Moynihan, uh, he takes credit in his memoirs for having, as he puts it, rendered the United Nations utterly ineffective in anything it tried to do about Timor uh, uh, under State Department orders because, as he says, the United States wanted things to turn out as they did. Uh, he knows how they turned out. The next sentence says within a couple of months they had killed 60,000 people, a proportion of the population comparable to what the Nazis had done in Eastern Europe uh, during the Second World War, and then sort of on to the next topic. Uh, that's why he is regarded as a leading exponent of uh, uh, international law and human rights and the need to follow, you know, always trot it out to uh, uh, talk about how holy and great uh, uh, international law is and how terrible it is that uh, all sorts of third world maniacs undermine the United Nations and so on and so forth. Uh, the diplomatic and uh, military support was critical and uh, not secret, but silence, wrong story. It's like those propagandists for the guerrillas that the economist is uh, uh, worried about who are trying to impu impugn the noble character of this man who is at heart benign. Uh, well, uh, there have been just coming up to the present, in 1990-91, there was a kind of a surprising new focus on Timor. And as Arnold pointed out, it was in the context of the uh, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, uh, which uh, was remarkably similar. Uh, a big, powerful country invading and conquering and annexing a small, oil producer, Timor is apparently, I mean, that's for certain, but it apparently has rich oil reserves in the Timor Sea between uh, Timor and Australia. Uh, the two invasions are not entirely comparable. Historical actions never are. Uh, Suharto probably killed about, uh, well, uh, how many times? Probably a hundred times as many people, I guess. Uh, in, in the uh, invasion of uh, East Timor. Uh, but uh, aside from, you know, in general, they had striking similarities, and it was hard not to notice them, and they were indeed noticed. Uh, there were various tortured explanations given as to why we were being noble and uh, defending Kuwait from Saddam Hussein, and also being noble and supporting uh, Indonesia while it was uh, uh, destroying uh, uh, East Timor. I'll put aside the explanations, which again have to be looked at to be believed, but there were some people who said it straight uh, to their credit. One of them was uh, the foreign minister of Australia, Gareth Evans, uh, who simply pointed out that there is no binding obligation not to recognize uh, acquisition of territory by force. The world is an unfair place littered with examples of acquisition by force. So let's be honest about it. Uh, at the same time, the Australian Prime Minister, Prime Minister Hawke, said, uh, big countries cannot invade small neighbors and get away with it. Uh, the weak will feel more secure because they know that they will not stand alone if they are threatened, now that all nations know that the rule of law must prevail over the rule of force uh, uh, in international relations. Uh, they know this because of the righteous uh, Anglo-Americans. Uh, who have established that lesson. Of course, he was talking about Iraq and, uh, and Kuwait. These were side by side. Uh, in England, uh, British intellectuals lectured with due gravity about the uh, nobility of their ancient traditions, while uh, British aerospace entered into the uh, biggest military deal with any Southeast Asian nation uh, right after the uh, 
principles of international law had been upheld. This was with Indonesia, uh, right after principles of international law had been held and upheld in Kuwait. Uh, all of this goes by without anybody batting an eyelash. Occasionally, you get a you know, a few words of uh, explanation of how it really makes perfect sense, uh, but that's about it. Uh, actually, we're going through that right now. Uh, it's kind of amazing to see how compartmentalized minds can be. Big front page story in the British press for the last couple of days or weeks has been uh, uh, Matrix Churchill and that whole business. Uh, the fact that uh, Britain was, in fact, as everyone knew for years, I don't know why they seem surprised about it, Britain and the United States were, of course, uh, helping to arm their friend Saddam Hussein, who was a moderate. He was a moderate upholding stability, and in fact, he committed his first crime on August 2nd, 1990, when he stepped out of line. Up until then, you know, he was just massacring Kurds and things like that, which is no big deal. Uh, so, of course, they were arming him and, in fact, keeping uh, the British machine tools industry going and so on and so forth. Uh, that's on the front pages. Uh, at the same time, Britain is, I think, Peter Carey will tell the details, but I, I think that Britain has now become the leading military supplier to uh, Indonesia. Uh, you can't make a distinction between Suharto and Saddam Hussein. They're the same, you know, just clones, basically. So on the one hand, we're agonized about the past error, uh, what happened, there'll be an inquiry and investigation about uh, sending arms to Saddam Hussein. At the very same time, uh, the British military industry is trying to whip up more arms sales for Indonesia, and that can go by in two sectors of the mind without any interference between them. Some curious thing about the way brains are hooked up. Uh, curious thing that you see constantly when you look at uh, international affairs and political culture. Uh, in November 1991, uh, there was another uh, revival of concern over Timur. Uh, what happened is the Indonesians made a tactical error. Uh, namely, they carried out a massacre in front of television cameras. That is always a mistake for those of you who hope to be national leaders. Uh, massacres have to be carried out when nobody's looking, or at least when the press pretends it's not looking. You can't carry them out while the television cameras are focused on them. That's a mistake that countries have found over and over again. Uh, and, and when you make this mistake, there's a routine that you go through. Uh, you set up an investigating commission uh, which deals with it and it gives some light taps on the wrist to the people responsible for the massacre. And then your friends abroad laud you for the magnificence of your willingness to come to terms with this kind of marginal deviation from your usual high principle, and everything goes back to where it was. Uh, that was the game that was played uh, with regard to Indonesia as well this time. It didn't entirely work for one thing that television films did get shown. I don't think they've yet been shown in the United States. Have they? Yes. Have they? Yeah. Well, of course, I don't watch television. I just read the newspapers. It's a limit to my masochism. But uh, they, they have been in, uh, uh, in England. They, there was also the mistake of uh, beating and practically killing uh, a couple of Western reporters, two American reporters, a British reporter. That doesn't look very nice. Uh, so the uh, matter has remained. And in fact, there were consequences. Uh, one consequence of the November 1991 massacre uh, was that uh, uh, there was a sharp increase in the arrangements for oil leases uh, in uh, the uh, Indonesia, in the Timor Sea. Uh, Australia's, uh, uh, Gareth Evans' comments that I quoted before were in the context of a treaty uh, that Australia had signed with Indonesia to exploit uh, Timorese uh, wealth. Uh, raises a number of other questions. Uh, you know, one might ask what the reaction would have been, say, if Libya had uh, joined with Iraq to exploit Kuwaiti oil uh, in uh, the fall of 1990, but let's put that aside. Uh, after November 91, the uh, uh, dozens of Western oil companies from all the major countries raced into uh, the Timor Sea to use these new opportunities to steal uh, Timor's resource resources thanks to the Australia-Indonesian uh, Treaty, which is now being questioned before the World Court. 
Uh, that was one consequence. Second consequence was here in Britain. Uh, Britain stepped up its uh, military sales to Indonesia. A third consequence, which is a little different, was in the United States, which was interesting and surprising and significant for the future. Uh, there was, in the United States, Congress actually terminated uh, the military aid to Indonesia. Uh, now that means they terminated the arrangements for Indonesian officers uh, to come to get training, uh, to get the right orientation, as uh, McNamara had put it. Uh, in Boston, there was an interesting sidelight to this on, on here it is, on the uh, anniversary of the Dili massacre, uh, there's a, the Boston newspaper has an article on November 12th which says, headlined, Indonesian general facing suit flees Boston. Uh, and it starts by saying, an Indonesian general accused of contributing to the deaths of as many as 200,000 people has fled the Boston area after being sued by family members of a victim. Uh, lawyers who filed the suit said yesterday, it's one people in charge of the massacre in Dili. Uh, he uh, was apparently coming to Harvard, the Kennedy School of Government, where they have a special program for third world murderers to teach them how to <laughs> do it better next time. Uh, and and uh, uh, Harvard denied that he was attending school there, but that was apparently a lie. Uh, this happened last year, I should say, and it's becoming a pattern and an interesting one that others could follow. Uh, last year uh, at Harvard, uh, they had a, a, another clone of Saddam Hussein and Suharto, General uh, Gramajo of uh, uh, Guatemala is another moderate, he's the State Department uh, favorite, in fact, for the next elections. He was the guy who was largely responsible for the genocidal massacres in uh, the Guatemalan highlands in the early 1980s, which also led to a lot of euphoria and support in the West, I should say. Uh, he was, th there were reports in the Central American press that he was coming to Harvard. I suggested to some local activists that they look into it. Harvard denied it, uh, but it turned out he was there. And on graduation day, the same law firm uh, served him with a subpoena on graduation day, so it was hard to miss. Uh, and, and he fled the country and, in fact, uh, forfeited the suit and owes $10 million. Uh, now they did it again with the Indonesian general, and it's probably the same story. Uh, it's an interesting tactic. The, it'll become really interesting when they start applying it to the people who can't flee to their own countries. Then we'll really be in business. Uh, anyway, these things, uh, uh, these things uh, happened. They happened because of intensive work of a very small number of people. In fact, primarily one. Arnold Cohen has been carrying this thing on his shoulders basically alone uh, with occasional help from someone else for, since the beginning. And it's a remarkable example of what people, few people can do. Uh, it has gotten to the point where uh, uh, Indonesian generals can't come to Harvard anymore because they're going to be, uh, they're going to have to flee the country because of the reaction to their atrocities and where Congress will actually cut back and eliminate military aid, meaning it'll probably still go on, but some, through some more devious means. Uh, if the same thing happened in the United Kingdom, it could make quite a difference, a major difference, especially now that Britain has become the major, I think the major, certainly one of the major military supporters. Uh, that's the most important lesson to bear in mind, in my opinion. Uh, ben Anderson, who's one of the world's leading specialists on Indonesia, just gave some talks in Australia uh, in which he expressed his feeling that there is a fair chance for the first time that Indonesia may want to rid itself of uh, what by now is becoming something of a nuisance. Uh, he quoted the foreign minister of Australia, of Indonesia, uh, who said that Timor is like a sharp piece of gravel uh, in our shoes. Uh, and uh, I think that tells us something. If we make that piece of gravel sharper, uh, uh, perhaps one of the world's major atrocity stories may finally be brought to an end. Thanks.
think we have some time for questions. It may be that uh, some people need to go. Um, and please do so if you need to depart now. But uh, there will be 10 minutes for questions which come up after of any of the three presentations which were made, particularly from Professor Chomsky's talk. So we just have an intermezzo for about a minute to resettle themselves. There is a, a chance for you to ask Professor Chomsky or Joan Govida or Arnold what it has been like to, to hold the, the fort in the United States in terms of the East Timor issue and where developments might go from here and what sort of pressure might be applied, particularly here in the United Kingdom, where an unconscionable level of military assistance and aid is still going without question, government to government, to the Indonesian generals. Yes. Well, um, he was asking, you made an appeal at the end of your, your presentation right. to say, please take up your pens and write to your MPs. 15 million in overseas development aid goes to Indonesia every year, but you said since that aid is useful, it should not just be cut, but it should be made conditional. That's right. Yeah. Would you like to add anything to that? Mm. <coughs> Well, practically, what I want you to do is to write to your MP and to ask him to intervene on behalf of the Timorese people in terms of not cutting the aid to the Indonesian government, but to attach strings to the aid itself that is to put conditionality on aid. I guess that's what I really want to say. Thanks. Are there other questions? Um, what, do you know what is the aid being spent on? ODA assistance to Indonesia, what is it mainly spent on? Sorry. What is the ODA assistance mainly? spent on at the present time? Um, I might be able to shed some light. Quite a lot yeah. of it's going on forestry. Mm. And quite a lot of the stuff that's going on forestry is in the form of a, um, an aid trade provision for the purchase of sophisticated telecommunications equipment um, to allow the Central Forestry Office to communicate with its offices round and about on the different islands. So you, you can draw your own conclusions. Right. Well, I'll ask Arnold perhaps to add some things, but the questioner asked, is East Timor unique or there are other areas of which Irian Jaya, West Irian, and the Republic Maluku Selatan, the RMS, which briefly um, attempted to get a secession from the Republic in 1950 to 52, what has happened in these areas? I would just like to preface any reply by saying that there is a very significant difference between East Timor and the other two areas which have been alluded to. In 1948, the Prime Minister of Indonesia, the soon to become a Vice President of Indonesia, Mohamed Hatta, made a public statement about what the, the boundaries of the Republic would be. This was at a time when Indonesia after the second police action was still deeply marred in its own guerrilla war against the Dutch. 
And he said that as far as we are concerned, the boundaries of the Republic will be exactly the same as those of the Netherlands East Indies, which of course did not include from 1913 with the demarcation of the East-West Timor boundary, which was internationally um, demarcated, East Timor. So East Timor is a case of breach of international law, whereas as far as the Republic of the Malaccas or Irian, it is something which has occurred within an area which has, has been claimed and is part in the Indonesian Jakarta view of the Republic. The RMS is interesting because within Indonesia it is I perhaps stand corrected as far as Aceh is concerned, but it is the one case of an attempt to secede from the Republic. 57, 58 were federal revolts, there have been federal revolts, but the RMS was an attempt to secede, and it was very much a legacy of a colonial past, namely that uh, very special um, credits, very special arrangements, a very special culture grew up in the, Repub in the South Malaccas. Um, rather like the martial races of India. The Ambonese were used in the colonial army. They, they spoke Dutch. They had a, a sort of a Dutch acculturation and religious acculturation, because most of them were Protestant, which set them apart from, at least culturally and religiously, and in terms of their historical experience, somewhat apart from the rest of Indonesia. And then when the Republic gained its independence in 1949, its formal independence, they saw all these goodies drying up and they were reluctant to go and sort of eke out an existence in the sort of El Al type um, suburbs of, of Amsterdam and they wished to fight for their own independence. But that has to, to a large extent been extinguished and a, a, a third and fourth generation have now grown up in, in, in the Netherlands who don't want to go back to Indonesia particularly who have now become acculturated to Dutch society, and that, to some extent, has wound down. As far as Irian Jaya is concerned, this is very much more akin to the situation in East Timor with the proviso that it does form a part which has been claimed. And I think I would turn to maybe Arnold. Would you like to say something? The, the only thing I would add to that is, is simply to say that the, the legal rights that the East Timorese have um, are really uh, the only thing in, in, in the inter in an international sense that they've had going for themselves all these years. That is, uh, the Indonesians don't have a right to East Timor. Now, the situation is very bad in West Irian, but it's a separate case. It has to be solved in its own terms, as do these other regional questions. It, it's not in any way to, to uh, undercut or minimize what's happening in these places. But the legal rights are something that the East Timorese have to hold on to for dear life. I mean, now in Washington, you have uh, various uh, moderate scholars and, and policy types who didn't really want to know about East Timor, East Timor before, saying, well, look, you know, let's solve the East Timor problem by democratizing Indonesia. And, and somehow, uh, the East Timorese will get their rights. I say, you know, what kind of talk is this? I mean, the, 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 the Timorese are, are supposed to make some kind of backroom uh, deal, you know, you know, maybe we'll, we'll help you at some point, you know, maybe something will happen. I mean, the only reason that there's, there's all this talk at all is because of, of the massacre last year and the fact that, you know, the, the uh, situation uh, continues to be serious and it won't really go away. I mean, just the other day, a leading columnist for the New York Times, one of their uh, uh, more decent commentators mentioned East Timor as one of three issues that Bill Clinton should address. So it's, it's quite different than it was, you know, 25 years ago when James Reston was calling it a gleam of light in Asia. And, and uh, in, in terms of television, there are more programs that, have, that, that are looking toward putting something on the air and something was just on a couple of months ago. And so this is a serious problem next to the silence that existed all these years. But the idea is, is that the, the legal rights that the Timorese have have to be uh, held quite separate from any other issues with regard to the Indonesian archipelago. Uh, 
question was about Guatemala and Nicaragua. Has the decline in U.S. military aid to Central America, no, uh, it, it, to Indonesia, been, a, been accompanied by been accompanied by a rise in Israeli, Israeli, and other things? Uh, well, actually, that was going on already in the 70s. Uh, in uh, I think it was 1978, I believe Mondale was that when he went to. Yeah, in, in 1978, the Vice President Walter Mondale. Uh, went to Indonesia spreading the message of human rights. Remember, that was the soul of our foreign policy in those days. Uh, and he was very impressed with what he saw in Indonesia, so impressed that he contacted Washington from there telling them they got to really send Indonesia some advanced jet planes. This was right at the peak of the massacres in uh, East Timor. Uh, and there are various re congressional restrictions on that. It's hard. So they got Israel to send them uh, American planes, Skyhawks, I think, uh, in, in 1978 to help help out the good work that Indonesia was doing for human rights there. Uh, whether that's going, exactly what's going on in that connection in the 1980s, I don't know. Uh, uh, these things are not easy to determine. Uh, the United States is an unusual country in that we actually can f know, we can get to know what military aid is going. Sometimes it takes a little work, but there are records and they're more or less accurate. And if they're not, you can get somebody in Congress or somewhere to dig out the right ones. Most countries you can't find out. So I, for example, I think it would be extremely difficult to find out, say, what Belgian aid is going to various countries. At least I don't know anybody who's tried to do it, and I suspect if you tried to do it, it would be very hard. I don't know what the situation is like in England. Uh, in the case of Israel, it's basically, you know, these are all state secrets. I mean, you can learn about them and from one or another leak or something of that kind. Uh, so all kinds of things are going on that, you know, you can only find out about by investigative reporting and all kind of inquiries and so on and so forth. It's not that the United States doesn't carry out clandestine activities. Of course, it does, plenty of them, huge ones. Uh, but at least things like direct military aid are pretty public. So for example, it is possible to learn, say, too, too late, you know, a couple of years later, that during the late 1970s, uh, when the Carter administration claimed that it was cutting, down, cutting out aid to Guatemala, uh, as the atrocities were really peaking, that that was just a lie. Uh, the Pentagon printouts show that the military aid went at approximately the normal level right through the 70s, barely changing. In the case of Indonesia, uh, after the Indonesian invasion of East Timor, uh, there was a public uh, statement that the US uh, was imposing a six-month arms ban on Indonesia until the situation sorted itself out. Uh, I think it was Ben Anderson who figured that one. Ben Anderson, who I mentioned before, discovered that that was another lie. And in fact, not only had that six-month ban been so secret that the Indonesians had never heard about it until they heard this announcement, uh, but also during the six-month ban, the United States actually approached Indonesia with offers for new counterinsurgency equipment, you know, counterinsurgency aircraft, and so on. Uh, so if you if you work in relatively open countries like the United States and probably England, you can probably get the answers to these things. But in most countries, it's very hard to penetrate. And, most, and people don't try, interestingly. Regarding the ASEAN countries, uh, initially when East Timor was invaded, Singapore was quite upset and abstained on the first UN vote, you know, remembering the old period of confrontation with Malaysia, worrying that the Indonesians could potentially uh, harm them under wrong circumstances. Now, due to the fact that ASEAN is, is a regional alliance, I think the Indonesians were able to whip everybody more or less into line and, and uh, you know, everyone more or less goes along with everyone else's policies, and so they were able to enforce some kind of regional discipline. Um, one of the problems about not more, uh, about 
the fact that there's not more support from the South is that the Indonesians have been able to call on certain countries that are with Indonesia in OPEC. And so that automatically takes out certain important countries. Then they say a country like India seized Goa in the early 60s and doesn't really want anybody bringing up issues like this. And so they're able to separate, say, an important country like India. Uh, they're able to uh, co-opt certain Islamic countries on, on basis of Islamic solidarity uh, and essentially use their old position as leader in the third world, an old position that, that really, you know, dated back to the 50s to, uh, to really call in a lot of um, favors. I mean, for example, when East Timor was first invaded, uh, the then foreign minister of Indonesia had been very close to who, what was then Yugoslavia. And they got the Yugoslavians essentially to help them within uh, private diplomatic channels and amongst the Eastern Bloc and other non-aligned countries not to do anything. And so the Indonesians being a big, powerful, you know, third world country. After all, I mean, now they're the fourth largest country in the world after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And uh, the Timorese, in terms of third world support, had on their side at the beginning the, the former Portuguese colonies in Africa. and. Uh, a number of other countries were helpful, but uh, the foreign Portuguese colonies in Africa, as we know, have had their own problems, quite severe. And so uh, I think that is largely what's lied behind the lack of support from the South. But I, I must add that the, the policy uh, on East Timor that's enabled the Indonesians to do what they've done all these years has been you know, military and economic support from the West and Japan. So, uh, and, and if the United States and other countries want this problem to be solved under the rubric of the United Nations, the opposition of certain southern countries is not going to make terribly much of a difference. I mean, it, it certainly didn't on, on Kuwait and other places. Well, you know, every country is an artificial creation. It's just a question of how many people you could kill before, you know, you got the boundaries fixed where they were. Uh, in the South, uh, the things called countries are the relics of European savagery. I mean, Europe, after all, conquered the world uh, in a very savage and brutal fashion, and it left it a wreck. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, you know, I sort of try to pick up the pieces after the Europeans got through with it, but boundaries have been put here and there and so on and so forth, and you know, you kind of stick to them, like the Organization of African States insists upon keeping to the totally idiotic boundaries that were imposed by European colonialism, simply because they know, they're right in doing it, because they know that once you start giving those up, you're, you know, you've got Yugoslavia. I mean, uh, you have to pick the best of a lot of rotten choices uh, after the uh, European savagery swept through and decided it wasn't worth exploiting any longer. Uh, in the case of Iraq and Kuwait, that's, you know, that's, uh, I mean, the British simply drew the boundary where they wanted it from all the region. And the boundaries were drawn in such a way as to ensure uh, that, uh, well, in fact, it's, it's, you, you can read it in the, a lot of the British records are, uh, uh, open now, uh, dealing with this, and they're very explicit. Uh, back around the First World War, uh, Britain decided that it didn't have the power any longer, didn't have the force to control the empire uh, with troops. It was just, didn't, Britain was declining and couldn't do that any longer. Uh, so therefore, there were a couple of measures that were selected. Uh, one of them, which in fact was strongly supported by Winston Churchill, uh, was to use poison gas 
uh, particularly against Kurds. He thought they were a particularly good choice. Uh, and uh, that, he said, will uh, strike a lively terror uh, in the uh, hearts of uncivilized tribesmen. Uh, and he was very angry about the squeamishness of those in the foreign office or who didn't like this idea. Uh, and in fact, that was used. Uh, there's uh, uh, Lloyd George, uh, a couple of years later, uh, insisted that Britain uh, undermine the disarmament conference of 1932. Uh, it was tr there was a big disarmament conference which was trying to put a barrier against bombardment of civilians. And Lloyd, uh, Britain succeeded in preventing that measure from going through because, as Lloyd George put it privately, uh, we have to reserve the right to bomb the niggers. Uh, and and uh, that's, that's the British tradition and that's British culture. You've got to reserve the right to bomb the niggers. You've got to use poison gas if you want to against uncivilized tribes. Uh, and these measures were required once you no longer had the force to just control the empire directly. The other technique that was used, and this brings us more directly to Iraq and Kuwait, is to, uh, uh, I, I should say, incidentally, that if Britain were really a free country, this is the kind of thing you'd be learning in elementary school. You know, you wouldn't have to wait for somebody to tell it to you. Same holds for the United States and every other country, Keteris, Parabas. Uh, the other technique that was used, which was suggested by Lord Curzon and the Parliamentary Commission during the First World War, was to create what they called an Arab facades uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the Middle East region uh, to uh, veil colonial control behind constitutional fictions like buffer state and protectorate and so on. Those would be Arab facades. Uh, the idea, and that's the system that still exists until today. The idea is to, you've got to ensure that the wealth of the region goes to the West. Uh, now that means the United States and Britain primarily, not to the local people. It's not, it's not done belong to them. And the way you do that is by constructing an Arab facade, a family dictatorship, uh, which is basically the local managers for the Western corporations and countries. And they can enrich themselves. The third world elites are allowed to enrich themselves if they do their job properly. But you gotta make sure that the mass of the population doesn't get in on this act. It doesn't belong to them. Uh, and that's uh, the history of Kuwait and Iraq. I mean, the boundaries were set up in such a way that uh, Kuwait in particular, uh, and, and in fact, uh, Saudi Arabia, the US did the same with Saudi Arabia and all the Gulf principalities. They are supposed to be Arab facades run by family dictatorships so weak that they do what you tell them. Uh, and, uh, and if they get into trouble, uh, they have regional enforcers like Israel and Turkey and Iran under the Shah, and they come in and smash people up. And if things really get out of hand, you call in the guys with the muscle, Britain and the United States, who really do the job properly for you. Uh, that's the structure of the system, and it remains that way. Kuwait was carved out as part of that system. Uh, in, if you want to really find out the, what went on, uh, this, this is, it's a kind of amazing that during the Iraq-Kuwait war, people didn't look at this more carefully, but uh, actually I know only one researcher, a woman in Britain, Kirsten, Kirsten Kale, who wrote in Living Marxism on this, who actually looked at the proper documents. Uh, amazing that nobody else looked. Uh, these are documents from late 50s, right after the Iraqi revolution, which scared the daylights out of everybody because it was a nationalist revolution, uh, which they thought at the time was Nasserite, that was taking over one of the oil producing regions. Turned out it was no big problem, but it looked dangerous at the time. At that point, the British Foreign Secretary, Selwyn Lloyd, flew immediately to Washington. Uh, they, they were very upset. The US invaded Lebanon right afterwards and threatened to use nuclear weapons, in fact, if things got out of hand. Uh, Selwyn Lloyd flew to Washington. They had discussions with Dulles and so on. It's all available in the British and American records parallel. They say the same things. Uh, the decision was made to grant Kuwait nominal independence so that the infection wouldn't spread any further, the nationalist infection. However, uh, as Lloyd put it internally, uh, Britain reserves the right ruthlessly to intervene uh, in case anything goes wrong in Kuwait, no matter what the source. In other words, anything goes wrong with this arrangement, we ruthlessly intervene. The United States, which is the big boy, uh, 
takes the same right with regard to the big prize, namely Saudi Arabia. Britain gets the little one, Kuwait, the United States gets the big one, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they explain the reasoning. Uh, Kuwaiti oil and the profits from it particularly, not just the oil, but the profits from it were very seriously needed to prop up the sterling area to maintain Britain's already sagging economy. Uh, and it's necessary to ensure that the Arab facade there keeps it flowing there. If they don't, we ruthlessly intervene. By the early 1970s, that was already beginning to become a problem for the United States as well. And in fact, both Britain and the United States gained uh, when the price rise, when the price of oil it was mixed. But they basically gained when the price of oil went up in the early 70s, for one thing, because they're both high cost oil producers. Uh, but for another thing, because the oil companies are basically Anglo-American, and their prices went up even faster than the oil price, so the profits came back here, uh, here in the uh, uh, United States primarily. So that, that's, that's where Kuwait comes from. I mean, you can say, yes, it's illegitimate, but of course, you know, name the state that isn't. I think we'd like to thank you all for, for coming. Maybe we could take one more, more question. Um, Oliver, would you like to? Uh, when our last Prime Minister came into power, that is our present Prime Minister, John Major, he gave the impression of coming in with a geopolitically reformist stance. He was talking about nice things like a register of international weapons sales. Um, and um, you know, one thought, well, you know, this is a move in the right direction. This is a good thing. I think that um, in the light of Matrix Churchill, we, we now know what the true agenda was pretty clearly, even if all the documents haven't come to light. Now, um, in the United States, I have perhaps a similar feeling about Bill Clinton, that here is someone you know, coming in with a possibly somewhat geopolitically reformist stance. Um, what, what, what is likely to happen in that room? Well, actually, uh, George, right after the Iraq war, uh, so-called war, there was, we should not really refer to it as a war. After the Iraq slaughter, a war is something where two sides shoot at each other. Uh, after that event, whatever you call it, was over, uh, Bush had a triumphal speech in Congress where he talked about the great tragedy of the world, in particular the Middle East, namely proliferation of weapons. And now that we have this wonderful new world order, we're going to have to cut back on weapon sales, and we have to control all this, and so on. And everybody applauded, and editorials, and so on. A couple of days earlier, the administration had presented to the Senate its plans for increased arms sales uh, all over the world, particularly to the Middle East. Then they went up beyond. By now, the United States is so far in the lead of, in arms sales that you can't even count. Uh, and. Uh, 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 they're peddling arms all over the place. The successes in destroying a defenseless country in Iraq were uh, where you were guaranteed that they wouldn't shoot back, so that's the way you become a hero. Uh, that, uh, those were used as a sales device. Par There's a big air show in Paris every year, and the next Paris air show, uh, all the companies went and they showed off these wonderful things that you could use to bomb the niggers and when they can't shoot back and so on. Uh, and, and you try to sell them to other killers, so they'll use them too. And of course, arms sales went way up. In fact, that's one of the ways in which the United States has compensated for the fact that there's been an attack on the Pentagon budget. Now, the Pentagon budget is somewhat, not much, but somewhat declined because of the loss of the traditional pretext, defense against the Russians. And one of the ways they've kept things going is by expanding arms sales. Uh, and I presume what happened in uh, uh, here is the same, though I don't know. Now, as far as Clinton is concerned, uh, Clinton is just another conservative Republican, you know? I mean, I'm amazed at what I've been reading in the British press about uh, the election. It certainly doesn't describe the country I see. I read in The Guardian the other day about how Clinton is a kind of beacon of hope for uh, the international left uh, after this inspiring uh, victory and so on that really galvanized Americans. It's kind of a caricature, but something like this. Uh, you know, Clinton was extremely unpopular. Uh, he's a conservative business candidate. He's the governor of a so-called right-to-work state. Right-to-work is a euphemism, which means illegal to organize uh, state. Uh, and uh, the, the Democrats this, in this last convention didn't even feel the need to make the usual gestures towards their traditional popular constituency. They didn't pretend to be anything other than a business party.
In fact, if you look at the international financial markets, uh, which tell you how the business community responds to things, uh, they were either stable or actually improved after the election because the international investors think, yeah, it's probably a good thing for the investment climate. I left uh, the United States last night, so the last papers I read were the Sunday papers, uh, where they uh, interviewed Robert Reich, who's the, uh, he's the kind of lefty extremist in the administration. He's one of the people who was with Clinton at Oxford. I don't know if you followed the role that Oxford plays in American mythology, but Oxford is the place where Clinton got these ideas about social engineering, which have destroyed Europe, you know, and that's why the U.S. economy is booming while Germany collapses and so on. But, and uh, uh, he and Clinton and Reich were here together, and he's sort of the, you know, the Keynesian lefty. And that interview with him in the Boston Globe, he's a Harvard professor, and he said, well, uh, maybe we won't have to carry out these public works programs and investment programs and so on that we were talking about. Maybe the uh, economy will recover on its own, although we should carry out an investment tax credit, in other words, regressive fiscal measures to benefit investors. Uh, and you know, the, how anybody can be surprised at this, I don't know. I mean, if you look at the institutional structure of American politics, it's perfectly obvious. Uh, in fact, of world politics. Uh, decision, you know, the power is in the hands of uh, those who own the place, and they set the parameters within which decisions are made. And you don't make it into the political system until you accept those rules, and if anybody got in who tried to break them, they'd be cut off very quickly. If you don't, can't figure it out for yourself, uh, you can read the Wall Street Journal, which will explain exactly what would happen if some American president were crazy enough uh, to try to carry out social welfare programs. Uh, what would happen is the international bond market, which is huge, I mean, I forget the numbers, but huge amounts of American government bonds are traded every day, I mean, astronomical numbers. Uh, the owners of the bonds would not like it, and when they don't like it, they pull out their money, which means that the interest rate goes up, which means that the economy collapses, and that's the end, okay? So if anybody were going to try to carry out these policies, they would be very quickly disciplined by what is called the market. That means the device by which uh, the rich men uh, who are already satisfied uh, rule the world, okay? Uh, and Clinton isn't about to make any mistake like that. I mean, the chances that a, a, the Clinton program will reflect a slightly different understanding of how to improve the profitability of American enterprise. Maybe, incidentally, some other people will benefit from it, maybe not, but that's an incident. And as far as arms sales are concerned, uh, the United States does face a structural problem now. Uh, it's a serious one. The, uh, the, the United States, there is no capitalist country in the world. I mean, the third world countries are supposed to be capitalist, but that's so that we can destroy them. Any country that has ever successfully developed has done it by violating those principles. That's true of England, that's true of the United States, it's true all the way up to South Korea. If you take a look at the modern American economy, the parts of it that function are the parts that get enormous amounts of government protection and subsidy. Actually, a pretty good article, a letter this morning in the Financial Times on the back page by some parliamentarian whose name I didn't recognize who gives some of the facts about this which are accurate. The United States is very heavily protectionist. Uh, the parts of the economy that function, like say electronics and pharmaceuticals and biotechnology, are basically state subsidized. There's no other way for that to work. The industrial program, the uh, 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 the, the industrial development program in the United States has been based in the Pentagon system. Uh, if you look at things like SDI, Star Wars, uh, the expenditures for Star Wars are approximately, are distributed about the same way as the expenditures by MITI, the Japanese, you know, Ministry of Industrial Trade and Industry, because they target the same technologies. You know, they expect, they make roughly the same judgments about what the emerging technologies do. In the United States, the way you do it is feed, them, feed it through Star Wars, but that's the function of the program and that's the way it was sold. Well, that's gone. You know, it's getting harder and harder. To, this means taxpayer subsidy. The taxpayers have to agree to pay off 
advanced industry by paying the costs of research and development and providing a state guarantee, a publicly guaranteed market for waste production in the hope that something will be profitable, at which point you turn it over to private enterprise. That's what's called free enterprise or private enterprise. Public pays the costs, and if anything comes out of it, you give it to rich guys who make the profit. And it's hard to sell that to people. You know? uh, so in the United States, the way it's been sold to people is the Russians are coming. Well, the Russians aren't coming, you know, so that makes it harder. And now there's a search for alternative techniques to develop the same programs. And that's why the people around Clinton are talking about uh, civilian state, uh, state involvement in, in research on civilian uh, production to replace Pentagon production. Of course, if you look closely, it's always pre-commercial. Okay, like the National Academy of Sciences just proposed a big government corporate enterprise which, in which the taxpayer will pay the costs of development for pre-commercial uh, research and development, crucially, because as soon as it gets to be commercial, that means you can make some money out of it. It goes back to the private system. That's the way state capitalism works. And there's, these are only matters of you know, technical adjustment uh, within institutional frameworks that are very resistant to change. Uh, and they will only change when the institutions change. I mean, short of that, you just have, you know, you move up and back in a very narrow space. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to bring the session to a, a close now. And I'm sure you'd like to join me in thanking Professor Chomsky very much indeed for a tour de force and an enormously unique occasion in which this is. Um, I'd also like to encourage you to actually look at the exhibition on East Timor, which is downstairs in the restaurant, which will be open till 10 tonight and will go on until the 13th of December. I think it's a very moving and a very special exhibition because of the way in which the photographs, particularly the ones relating to 1991, were taken and it's an opportunity not to be missed. Thank you. Wenner, who actually took the footage, the video footage, in the cemetery itself, and many others who supported that work, that the world knew about what had been going on, something of what had been going on in East Timor. It was certainly not the first massacre. Aria Branca, La Cluta, Craras, there had been many massacres which had punctuated the bloody rule and occupation of the Indonesians since 1975, but this was the first time that it was actually shown across the world. Australian customs officials and authorities tried to, in fact, confiscate the tape. So sensitive was Australia to the ramifications of showing that film. And it's to their credit and to their enormous courage that we know today what we do know about East Timor. And a room like this can be filled almost to capacity in order to hear a talk on East Timor. No doubt the character of the main speaker tonight, Professor Chomsky, has been a major draw. We've hijacked him from the philosophers for one night, and we're very pleased to have been able to do so. But it's also, I think, very much due to the publicity and to the awareness, the growing awareness, which has enabled such a gathering to come into being. We'd like to send a message tonight to the people of East Timor that they have not been forgotten, that they have a hope for a better world, and that Oxford, which has a link now with the presidency in the United States, can have an influence on events, um, perhaps larger than one might think. There will be a student um, club, 
and Student Society Association, which will be founded, called the Friends of East Timor, which will be founded at St. Anne's, and the founders are here tonight, and if you'd like to, to know more about it, you can get in touch with me or, or others who are involved with work on East Timor. So without further ado, I, I will turn to Zhuang Boavida, who is a uh, graduate student at Campion Hall, working on a thesis to do with nationalism and religion in East Timor. And most of all, he has been a personal witness to the events which we will be talking of tonight. Thank you. I hope you can hear me and that the mic is, is functioning properly. Well, ladies and gentlemen and friends, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Museum of Modern Art and to this lecture by Professor Chomsky, um, which is being held in conjunction with a major exhibition on East Timor, which is, uh, can be seen in the um, downstairs in the restaurant. And I hope that you will be able to see it uh, after this, this meeting. It will be open for half an hour afterwards. The format of tonight will be that I will make a very short opening address. I will then turn to Jean Boavida, who is an East Timorese, who is now studying at Campion Hall, to give something of an impression of what it has been like to actually live through the years of the Indonesian military occupation, and to particularly dwell on the developments which have happened within the East Timorese Church, the Catholic Church of East Timor, and the way in which that has focused in and helped to sustain um, the growing nationalist resistance in East Timor. Arnold Cohen will then follow. Arnold has been almost single-handed the architect of keeping East Timor in front of the public eye in the United States during 16 years when it was extremely difficult for, mo for much of that time to really be able to hold it as an issue of major public concern because of the way in which the press and those who could report what had been going on in East Timor were excluded and were banned from visiting the territory and also from what Professor Chomsky will be talking about in the fourth uh, presentation, the international matrix which has kept East Timor um, in the position it has been in during the past 16 to 17 years. I'm a specialist on Indonesian history and to my shame it took me nearly 10 years to actually realize what was happening in East Timor. I remember the first indication that something was pretty seriously wrong was when I was sitting in a restaurant in Leiden. But there is certainly an explosive phenomenon which has taken place in East Timor over the last 17 years. And this phenomenon is the real religious element which I'm going to describe it briefly in the following terms. First and foremost, since the Indonesian invasion of East Timor in 1975, the Timorese Church has adopted an attitude of mutual accommodation with the Timorese people. Throughout the 17 years of occupation, the Catholic Church in East Timor has given all sorts of supports and in several ways to the suffering East Timorese people. In other words, the Timorese Catholic Church has been the only and real haven in East Timor under those 17 years and continues to be. And secondly, as the Timorese Church begins or began to look at the Bible from the underside 
that is, from the perspective of the suffering Timorese people, many East Timorese came in mass in big numbers and converted to Catholicism. From 30% of Catholics in 1975, when the Indonesians, or when the Portuguese government left East Timor, the number went up 60%, and now the total number of converted, of those converted to Catholicism is something around 95%. If the figure means anything at all, it must mean that this is a potentially, um, when I first went to Australia in 1987, I was invited to give a talk at one of the universities in Melbourne. Um, I was quite nervous at the time because my English wasn't very good. And before the talk, there was a student who came to me and asked me whether I was the speaker. And I said yes. She then went on saying that she knew quite well about the plight of the Timorese people and that she was very upset about her government's policy on East Timor. And then she asked me where exactly East Timor was. And she wondered whether it was somewhere in the northern suburb of Victoria. And of course, I said yes. <laughs> but a bit further north. So we literally went through all the suburbs around Victoria. And we ended up at the top end of Australia, which is Darwin. By then, she realized the mistake she had made, that she simply had mistaken East Timor with one of the Aboriginal tribes in Australia. Well, what exactly I want to say tonight, it's nothing complex. The simple fact that the Timorese struggle still survives today, it is mainly due to the Catholic Church and its priests in East Timor. And by this, I don't mean to undervalue and to undervalue the spirit of nationalism of the Timorese people themselves, and nor do I overlook the efforts of individuals and group solidarities around the world. And read that five Western journalists, two Britons, Australians and New Zealander, had been shot and killed while covering the war at Balibo in October of 75. And I thought, well, it's a bit odd for five journalists and cameramen just to be wiped off the face of the earth just like that, just fulfilling their duties. And it was not until 1983 when I was asked to review the book written by James Dunn, an excellent book on East Timor called Timor, A People Betrayed, that I realized what had happened to them, that they'd been shot in cold blood by the Indonesian army, and that not only they had died, but somewhere around 100,000 Timorese out of a population of 688,000 had died in the first three and a half years of the Indonesian occupation alone, per capita and in terms of the suffering per square inch in East Timor, certainly perhaps greater than that even of Pol Pot's Cambodia. In the following year, after 83, we tried to hold a meeting to coincide with a visit to Oxford by Jose Ramos Horta, who later came as a visiting fellow to St. Anthony's, and like Arnold, has been very much instrumental in terms of holding the, the cause of East Timor aloft in the UN and in major international circles, in the circles of diplomacy and international relations.
for very long periods of time. He has been a principal advocate of East Timor's right of self-determination and the right for a future which the people of East Timor can decide for themselves. And when we organized a meeting in New College, um, barely 20 people turned up. It was a beautiful hall, as large as this, but 20 people were there. And I think it's a measure of the change which has been wrought during the past year, a change which occurred because of the massacre, the Santa Cruz massacre, and the way in which that massacre was reported in the West. Two of the journalists and photographers who were there at the time, Steve Cox, who took the photographs, some of which you can see downstairs in the exhibition, Peter Gordon, who headed the Yorkshire television team, which made the very moving documentary on East Timor, which was shown in January last year, both are here tonight. And it's due to the courage of Peter and Steve 